Today is Trinity Sunday, and we are very grateful for all who are helping us with the service. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Gracious God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You alone are worthy of our praise. On this Trinity Sunday, we come as we are to worship you and to feel your loving presence with us. God of love and peace, we are thankful that you are there. In these difficult times, so much uncertainty around us and ahead of us, when we are not able to gather or meet with our loved ones, we are thankful for the compassion and love you show us through the kindness of others, through communities who care, and we pray that this same spirit of neighborliness continues to weave through our lives as you have taught us. Creator God, we rejoice in the wonders of your creation, the works of your hands, which in these times of isolation, we uh, have had more time to appreciate and respect its creativity and beauty. As we begin to see lockdown easing, guide us, Lord, to learn from the past months to build a better future for the world which you created so perfectly, but we have not cared for as we should. We ask for your help to live more simply, to stand up for injustice, care for the vulnerable, and create your kingdom here on earth as you have taught us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. The first reading today comes from 2 Corinthians 
chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. And now, my brothers and sisters, goodbye. Strive for perfection, listen to my appeals, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people send you their greetings. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Gospel reading is from Matthew 28, reading from verses 16 to 20. Jesus appears to his disciples. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go, then, to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. It is difficult to exaggerate the power of this text in the history of the Christian church. It has inspired so many people to go to distant places to announce the good news of God's kingdom. Many people left their homelands and spent their lives in very often in hospitable places. Many Christians were tortured, killed, or died young due to tropical disease in a far country because they believed that these words were addressed to them. And many believers, despite knowing the danger and the possible consequence, went to all nations of the world to share their faith in the love of God. Lives were lost, but their death inspired still more people to go. Their short lives were seen as a sacrifice comparable to Christ's sacrifice. A few years ago, I was in Malawi in a ceremony for the celebration of a theological institution that the Church of Scotland has supported through the years. The president of Malawi came and gave a speech. His words, his first words were, I was baptized in the Church of Scotland. My father was an elder in the Church of Scotland, and my mother was a member of the guild. Over 100 years ago, there were no Christians in Malawi. And now, about 85% of the population are Christians. This amazing growth of the Christian faith in Malawi, as well as in many other countries around the world, happened because a great deal of Christians read this text as speaking to them. A lot of Christians did not go abroad to preach the gospel. However, they prayed, gave money, encouraged, and welcomed the missionaries. They did everything they could to support the missionary work that was being done. And this impulse to go and share the gospel was not a new thing in the recent history of the church. The first disciples already understood that these words were expressing one of the fundaments of the Christian religion. It is in the DNA of Christianity to go and to share the good news of God's kingdom. 
it is the reason why Christianity went from a small group of marginal Jews to a religion of over two billion people, which is the biggest religion of the world. In the last decades, however, there were many criticisms to the way that the mission was done and its negative impact on many countries. A good deal of scholars has pointed out the fact that Christian missions worked alongside colonial interests. For some scholars, mission revealed the arrogance of the West who looked at themselves as superior to all other nations. To some extent, I agree with these criticisms. But the problem was with the interpretation of this text rather than with Jesus' command to go and share his message to everyone. Some people thought that they should make disciples of themselves and for themselves. However, the command is to make them Jesus' disciples. When Jesus said, teach them, he was not saying to teach them how to believe and how to confess their faith only. Jesus had taught his disciples a way of life. Jesus taught by words and especially by his deeds how to love, how to care, how to heal, how to welcome everyone. Jesus was a teacher and the teaching at the same time. And that is what the disciples should share with everyone in the world. Jesus' words inspire us to go, but they also challenge us to reflect on how to be messengers of Jesus Christ. To bear the message of Jesus Christ properly, we have to live as he lived, because that is the only way of understanding Jesus. We are called to teach every nation, but it does not mean that we do not have anything to learn from all nations in the world. On the contrary, living close to people, especially to the most vulnerable ones, we can learn a lot about faith, love, and hope. Mission is not a one-way road. The strength of Jesus' message is that sharing, we learn to give and receive. Loving, we learn how to love. And teaching, we learn how to learn. These verses are at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and they summarize everything Jesus did. Remember that the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their greatness and said he would give them to Jesus if Jesus worshipped him. Jesus refused to accept the easy glory and power promised by the devil and took the narrow path instead, the path of obedience. To God's love. Now he is on the top of a mountain with his disciples and tells them that he was given all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember also that Jesus gave his most beautiful sermon on the mount. Now again, on the mountain, on the mount, he is asking his disciples to share his teaching with all peoples in the world. The message is clear. The first disciples and all disciples after them need to carry on the ministry that Jesus performed, lived, and preached. Remember also, at the beginning of the Gospel, Matthew tells us that Jesus will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And now, at the end of the gospel, Jesus says, 
I will be with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is present when we share his message, when we look after those in need, when we bring comfort and justice to those who suffer. It is in the fellowship of the disciples that the presence of God becomes real. The text of Paul's epistle says about his fellowship. The grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are embodied in the life of the Christian community. We cannot share the message of love if we do not love each other, if we do not love our neighbors. Paul made reference to a brotherly case or a holy case. Apparently, the Christians believe before performed a ritual kissing during church gatherings. And Paul saw that ritual as a symbol of the fellowship that makes the church be the church as it must be. Due to this pandemic, we cannot kiss each other. And even when the church will be opened, we will not be allowed to kiss each other for some time being. But rather than physical contact, true fellowship is a sense and an attitude of love and affection for each other. Kisses, hugs, and shaking hands are just symbols of a deeper love that unites us. And the pandemic cannot destroy it as it is based on God's love expressed in the example of Jesus Christ, it given to us by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, our loving Heavenly Father, we are limited in our understanding of you, but we know that you made us and care for us and your creation. Thank you for loving us and being with us in good times and hard times. Thank you for Jesus, whose life shows us the way to life in all its fullness. Thank you for sending your Spirit to lead us and to teach us. Teach us to see the world around us as you do, Holy Spirit, that we may discern your wisdom and guidance in all our relationships. Help us to follow in your way, Jesus Christ, loving our neighbours and speaking out with courage against racism and all forms of injustice. Show us the beauty of your creation, God of the universe, that we may value everything that lives and cherish all that you have given us. Thank you, God, for all who teach us of you through their words and their lives, and for those who enable us to develop skills and gifts. Teach us to appreciate these gifts and give us grace to use them to bring healing to the world as we share and learn from one another. We pray for the world in which we live, for those who lead and take important decisions, and for those who follow or are coerced. We pray for mercy and justice, for compassion and integrity. We pray for protection against evil and strengthening of goodness. We pray for peace in the world and in our hearts. We call to mind all who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Those who lie awake at night wrestling with their thoughts 
who long for your healing and comfort, your strength for perseverance, and your patience in dark times. We pray for your healing spirit to envelop and sustain them, and for your healing touch on our lives. We thank you for all who lovingly care for others at home or in care homes, in hospitals and hospices. And we pray for all who need such care, who rely on others' help. We thank you for those who care for us. Give us grace to accept help and the strength to give our help to others when it is needed. We pray for pupils and students whose education has been disrupted, missing out on classes, missing friends. We pray for those worried about pass marks and further education or employment. We thank you for teachers and lecturers working to provide support and online teaching and parents endeavouring to provide schooling at home. Strengthen and encourage them and show us how we can be a support to those we know in these situations and help us all to keep on learning and growing together even while we are apart. Loving Creator, in the Spirit we pray and ask you to hear all our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
May God make safe to you each step. May God make open to you each pass. May God make clear to you each road. And may he take you in the grasp of his own two hands. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.